Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Someone who we have not mentioned in a long time who does a tremendous amount of really good work for us is Andrew Mount. I want to take this opportunity and say a public thanks to her. She does editing of the episodes. She works up the memes that we share on Facebook. And generally, whatever needs done, even before we know it, she jumps in and does it. If I had to choose which one of you had to go, I'd say, Anthony, have a, have a nice day. But I, I'm going to break in a different direction. It's going to be words and memes. That's right. You'll, you'll hear one day, Anthony has left to pursue other opportunities. <laughs> One of our listeners shared with us on our Facebook backstage group a chart that I found interesting. And let me give you the background first, and I'll tell you what I found interesting. People have some idea of the relative magnitude of government spending for various things. Although I suppose some people don't, because when I say these numbers, they're somewhat shocked. Top line item, no question, is Medicare and Social Security at $2.1 trillion. That's how much we spent last year at the federal level. Defense spending. Now, a lot of people think it's bigger than Social Security and Medicare. It's not. It's actually one-third. That's the entire Department of Defense and Homeland Security, the whole business, $700 billion, so seven-tenths of a trillion. And then welfare comes in about half that of four-tenths of a trillion. So think of those as like the big three things that people talk about. Medicare, Social Security, $2.1 trillion. Defense, seven-tenths of a trillion. Welfare, four-tenths of a trillion. Now, tax revenues. Do you know where the bulk of federal tax revenue comes from? I want to be agitated and say the income tax. You're absolutely right. But I'm right. guessing that's... No, you're right. Well... Two trillion. I thought you were tricking me. Nope. Two trillion came from the federal income tax. That's half of the money the federal government collected last year. Another one and a half trillion came from the payroll tax. And those are coming out of our paychecks. Income tax, payroll tax, that's like 85, 86% of total federal taxes. The estate tax that everybody loses their minds about, saying, you know, these billionaires dying with all this money in the bank and it should be taxed and all of that. Two hundredths of one trillion. That's how much the federal government collects from the estate tax. Income tax, two trillion. Payroll tax, one and a half trillion. Estate tax, two hundredths of one trillion. And here's where this interesting thing that our listeners shared comes in. This is a set of numbers I had not seen before, and they fall under the heading of tax expenditures. I hate that term. It's a term we use in economics. Tax expenditure means money that the federal government is not collecting because it gave somebody a tax break. I dislike the term expenditure because it implies that somehow the money belongs to the government and is now giving it to you. It's the same thing yet when politicians would say, this tax cut costs. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. What do you mean it costs? <laughs> it's my Ta money. Tax cut costs nothing at all. <laughs> so think of all of the special tax breaks that people might lose their minds over. Any idea of what the biggest one is? And when I say the biggest one, this is the biggest one by far, like almost twice the size of the second biggest one. Because one of the things people say is, you know, they'll talk about corporate tax cuts and tax cuts for the rich and there's write-offs that people get and all of this. None of that is it. The largest tax break that the federal government gives is... Oh, the mortgage tax break, right? No. It's the fact that employer-provided health insurance and retirement is tax-free. Right, right. Those two things cost the federal government, if you want to think of it as a cost, $5.2 trillion a year. That's $5.2 trillion the federal government would be collecting if it taxed employer-provided health insurance and retirement. And let's be clear, we're not advocating this. No, no, no. I'm just looking at the numbers. The second one, this is where your mortgage comes in. Favored tax treatment for housing, tax-free imputed rental income, capital gains exclusion, mortgage interest deduction, these sorts of things. They account for about $3 trillion. And again, this is not like $3 trillion of spending. It's $3 trillion the federal government would collect if it didn't give you all these nice tax breaks on your house. Then we get to the ones that people start to lose their minds over. The fact that capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than income. Shouldn't be taxed at all. Yeah, well, I think it shouldn't be taxed at all. But according to these numbers, that costs the federal government $1.5 trillion. So let's put this in perspective. The federal government taxes capital gains at a lower rate than it taxes income. And because of that, the federal government collects $1.5 trillion less than it would otherwise. In contrast, 
the favorable tax treatment that the federal government gives to regular people with their regular houses and regular people with their regular employer provide health insurance and retirement, those things combined cost the federal government $8.2 trillion. This is really adding up, isn't it? I get very nervous when people start looking at the tax code and jumping up and down on certain things saying, well, the rich get this benefit and they shouldn't have this. Be really careful doing that because the bulk of the benefit in the tax code, by far the bulk, goes to the middle class. It doesn't go to the rich. And if you start politicians down this path of, okay, let's tighten this down, let's stop giving out all this stuff we're giving out, yeah, guess what? They're coming for you next because that's where the big money is. It has ever been so. The middle class is the only group that can afford everything the government wants on an ongoing basis. There just aren't enough rich people in the country to make it work any other way. I forget the exact numbers. I mentioned them several months ago. The middle classes together, so it's lower middle class, middle middle class, upper middle class. Middle classes together earn twice as much as the top 1%, twice as much. And that's going to turn out to be their undoing. That, right. That's, politicians know that, and they're salivating. They want to get their hands on that money. Well, Ant, I'm going to bring us in a completely different direction, and a direction that harkens back to something I talked about a couple of weeks back. It's about the idiocy of daylight savings time. I think I explained why it's stupid before. What I'm going to point to is a very odd sequence of events that have occurred in the past week or two. The Senate started debating doing away with daylight savings time. Yes, I saw that. And then they voted on it, and it passed unanimously. You're kidding me. Unanimous. Wow. Think about all the things that don't get passed unanimously. Because there's always one crank in the room who has to say, no, I disagree for the following reasons. The Senate has passed it unanimously. It heads over to the House, and we may be done with this nonsense by next year. Oh, superb. One of our listeners, Tim, whose last name I can't remember, and he never includes it on as many emails to me, but Tim, this is for you. He asked, how does Congress have this authority in the first place? Which, actually, the right question to ask. I've got some of the U.S. code before me. And before anybody starts yelling about it, I know how boring this is, but it answers the question. The standard of each zone established by sections 261 to 264 of this title shall be advanced one hour. And here's where it gets interesting. However, any state that lies entirely within one time zone may, by law, exempt itself from the provisions of this subsection providing for the advancement of time, but only if that law provides that the entire state, including all political subdivisions thereof, shall observe the standard time otherwise applicable during that period, and two— any state with parts thereof in more than one time zone may, by law, exempt either the entire state as provided in number one or may exempt the entire area of the state lying within any time zone. So what you get is that states can, in fact, opt out. The question isn't what role the federal government plays here, or at least it doesn't have to be, because every state could remove itself from this nonsense. We've got a lot of problems with coordination through the two times a year when the clocks change for some but not for others. And that's, I think, where we find ourselves now. So the sensible question is, what's best? Do we keep changing the clocks twice a year or do we just say to hell with well, it? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't understand what this law does. Because in your case, Arizona doesn't change its time, which means that other I know, but your state does, and I can't keep my calendar straight. No, understood. But the other states could do what Arizona is doing right now. This law is not forcing them to do that. It's simply saying you can if you want to. A lot of times what you find is that on mundane matters like this, you often learn more about how your government acts and operates than you do when the stakes are really high. So this is going to be educational. I can't wait to see how this plays out because it's going to teach me a bunch of things about the United States House of Representatives, what the attitude in the House is toward the Senate, where the president comes down on all of this. I can't wait to see how it goes. This brings us, of course, to the foolishness of the week. And here I'm going to say that Washington, D.C. wins the foolishness of the week. And you're thinking, oh, God, what did those morons in the Capitol building do? But no, 
It's actually the city of Washington, D.C., or I guess the district oh, itself. Something we never think about. Be, it's That's right. Not since Mary and Barry did crack with a couple of prostitutes in a hotel room have we thought much about D.C. government. You forget there's a city there. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You might have actually noticed this. I know you're oblivious to most things like this, <laughs> but it recently became the case that sports betting is now legal damn near everywhere. Hmm. What do you find? Well, you find a bunch of private businesses rushing in. I get three mailers a week telling me that if I just open an account, they'll put $200 in it for me. Wow. Knowing that gamblers can't resist that sort of thing and that they'll eventually lose it anyway. Right. Washington, D.C. somehow managed to lose $4 million on its own sports betting app. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we left with by way of observation? Government can't even get sports betting right. Who did? Countless men in the old neighborhood who did business out of the back room at a barber shop. Right. <laughs> Those guys never went out of business on sports betting. You got to be kidding me. Who else? Every building in Vegas is testament to sports betting to some degree or another. And yet here we are, Washington, D.C. can't keep in the black when they run their own sports betting nonsense. Oh, my God. That's this is kind of like California right now. We're going to talk about this before long, I'm sure. California can't manage to make a profit with the marijuana sales. <laughs> well, and, and this one, you know exactly why. They added so much tax to a bag of weed that it makes more sense for people to keep buying it from that guy down the corner. <laughs> They did. California is not putting weed dealers out of business. It's advertising for them. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so there's, there's go. still a burgeoning trade in illegal weed in California. It's just illegal for a different reason. <laughs> yeah, that that's exactly right. I mean, you could buy it. As long as you don't get caught buying it from the guy, you could smoke it two steps down the road later and nobody's going to say a word. Right. Now, here's the astounding thing. If you had a business whose main job was to do something, sell computers, for example, and that business decided on the side to go into sports betting, the smart move is you subcontract the thing to somebody who already understands that business. Or you go buy an existing sports betting, that, but you understand that that's not your specialty. You hire somebody who does have that specialty. Not so, apparently, the city of Washington. Nope. I'm reading the story in Reason magazine. The subheading is this. Despite having a near monopoly on district-wide betting, poor decisions and mismanagement led to millions in losses on Gambit, D.C. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Here we are, James, at 2022, a little bit more than a decade after the Affordable Care Act went into operation. I hadn't realized it's been that long, but I guess it has. This was a train wreck of a piece of legislation for me. Did I ever tell you what happened with this? No. It's almost like that remark people make about student loans. If you think college is expensive, now wait until it's free. Right. Well, so too health care, because I remember when Obamacare was passed, I had had a pretty good job. The place I worked, Strata up in northern Utah, was folding up its tent so I took a buyout offer, and then I did not have any more income. And when I was unemployed, we started looking into how we would get health insurance for the family. And we got on the exchanges. Once you factored in the premiums I would pay and the deductible I would have to meet, I would have to pay $36,000 before anybody in the family had one penny covered out of it huh. in the plan. So right off the bat, I can tell you there was no way I could afford that. I could have dried up my bank account and afforded it, but we have to live here in the real world where we make hard choices. And what ended up happening was I did some math and I figured out, well, it's better for me to just pay the penalty. So for the privilege of not having health care, I ended up paying a penalty. It was hard to write that check. And then here's where they got a big fistful of salt to grind into my open wound. 
a year later, I got a piece of mail from the IRS and it said, we didn't charge you enough penalty on the health care. <laughs> Would you please give more? <laughs> please remit $1,400 more. Oh, my God. Oh, and if you think that's bad, I got to go look up what the fine was because it was way higher than that. I did not get covered because it was too expensive because it was free. The Affordable Care Act was signed into law in 2010, but it was phased into effect from 2011 through 2015. Now, what I wanted to do here as we stand about a decade out from its ratification is look at the promises and look at the realities of what's happened. And there were lots of words that were being said, but basically there were two things. This is documented all over the place you can find. President Obama promised that the average American family's health insurance premium would drop by $2,500. And he promised that everyone would be insured. I want to get to, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Yes, and also there was, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. But I'm looking at the data, and it's kind of interesting, because if you go back to 1980s, 90s, early 2000s, health insurance premiums were rising at double-digit rates. I think they averaged something around 14% a year from 1974 through 1982, and then it kind of calmed down a little bit to 10 to 12 percent thereafter. But that's ungodly. Let's put that into perspective. If you invested in something that paid out that kind of return, you'd be pretty wealthy pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. But then something happens around about 2005. The health insurance premiums, while they're continuing to rise, they rise more slowly and they slow down to about 5% a year. And then we have the Affordable Care Act phased in. And after the Affordable Care Act, how much are they rising a year? About 5%, about the same as what we had before. Now, we absolutely did not get the cut in health insurance costs that we were promised. The rate of growth is lower than it was in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, but the rate of growth now is about the same as it was just in the four or five years prior to the Affordable Care Act. So on that count, I'm not sure what we got here for our money. There are various arguments about why we had those giant increases back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and all of that goes beyond my expertise, other than to say that this is an economic issue, but we need to talk to a health economist about this. And we've gone out of our way for many years now not to offer too detailed an analysis of healthcare. Right, because it is so complicated that there's an entire field of economics devoted just to this one industry. And here's something that most people never say, but we're incompetent to do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's about right. Yeah, so we take a big giant breath and we look to the healthcare economists. All we can say is look, here's the trend. Now, the other thing that we were promised was that everyone would be insured. And of course, in a nation of 300 plus million people, there's no way you're going to get everyone insured just by the laws of randomness. But you can see an argument for getting basically everyone insured. There, it's kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, the fraction of uninsured Americans has almost cut in half. That's not nothing. Yeah. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was around 13 to 15 percent of the population uninsured fluctuating in that area. Since the Affordable Care Act, it's been around 8 to 9 percent. I'll take that every time if it doesn't come with all kinds of extra baggage. But then there's this other oddity. If you add up the fraction of Americans who are uninsured and the fraction of Americans who are on Medicare or Medicaid, that number is basically the same after the Affordable Care Act versus before. That story is consistent with people who were previously uninsured now are on Medicare Medicaid. In other words, you could achieve what I'm seeing in the data here simply by expanding Medicare to include more people, which I believe the Affordable Care Act did. And already my eyes are glazing over. What am I supposed to think about this big jumble of business that we're thinking about? The takeaway here is According to the numbers, it's unclear to me that the Affordable Care Act unto itself achieved anything at all. Rather, what appears to have happened is an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid has achieved this second item, which is a reduction in the number of uninsured. 
I'm not sure what I'm left with at the end of the day, but what is clear is that all this wonderful stuff we were promised did not come to pass. Now, on the other hand, it does not seem that the thing has blown up as many economists, myself included, said at the time that this is going to be a huge debacle. I don't know that it is a huge debacle, but it's not a resounding success either. And we're only now getting the relevant data that we would need to make that determination. When we look at per capita GDP or however you want to measure this sort of thing, it doesn't seem like any of them yield out a straight spike up to the top. It just seems to be more of the same, that soft leveling that's been in the numbers for the last 15, 20 years. Is it still going up? Yes. Is it going up some massive amount per capita? No, it's not. There's another consideration lurking in the background, which is we see the rising price of healthcare and equate that with badness, that this is a horrible thing, price of healthcare is going up. But we're ignoring what's happening on the other side of the equation, which is the quality of healthcare is going up. And there's this beautiful thought experiment that Don Boudreau introduced me to, is to ask someone, would you rather have today's health care at today's health care prices, or would you rather have 1970s health care at 1970s prices? And if the answer is you want today, then what you have just said is that, yes, the price has gone up, but the quality has gone up by more. And you can do that exact same thing with the 80s, the 90s, the aughts, sure. and the teens. Yeah, because it's going to be the same answer. When we think healthcare, we automatically think about price. But I always think about results because the healthcare that I get now is so much better than what anybody got in the 1980s. If I were born 100 years earlier, I'd already be dead. Yeah. I have no doubt about that. And if I weren't dead, I wouldn't have any of my limbs that have cut them all off because of various infections I've had. And you start to look at things that way and, well, I don't care what it costs. I'm still alive and I have my four limbs. What kind of price do you put on something like that? You get these anecdotes like you're giving. And the response I often get to stuff like this is, well, yeah, I can see you've got better diabetes treatment and you've got mechanical hearts and all sorts of things we didn't have before. But people say, look at infant mortality numbers. We've got the highest infant mortality numbers in the developed world. And what's fascinating about infant mortality, actually two things, one is that the numbers aren't uniform across countries. Germany, for example, does not count children who die within the first week of birth as infant mortality. If you don't survive more than a week, you don't show up in the numbers. Whereas in the United States, if you die 24 hours after birth, that's counted as infant mortality. And the better the prenatal health care is, the more likely sickly children will survive to be born in the first place. And so the higher infant mortality rate can actually be indicative of better health care. And I think that's precisely what we've got here. I don't know that every country is in that category, but I think the United States is. Something else that people say is that you have to be careful in the United States because you get sick, you don't have insurance, you just die. And that's actually not the case it's been the case for a while, actually since 1986, possibly longer than that. But in 1986, this was encoded into federal law, the Emergency Medical Treatment Act, in which Congress said that hospitals must accept anyone who shows up in an emergency room, regardless of whether they can pay. Now, the hospital will come after you trying to get you to pay after the fact. But by law, hospitals cannot refuse emergency services to anyone, regardless of insurance. And the unintended consequence here, of course, is that emergency rooms are often packed full of people who are not having an emergency. I hear the complaint often that people die on the streets in the United States because they have no access to health care. It's almost as if there are a group of people who are going to make an argument, facts be damned. But you can do your own analysis here. How many people do you know who died because they didn't have access to health care? Right. Almost everyone in the United States is going to answer zero, and they're going to do that same thing they always do. Well, it's great here, but in other places, it's terrible. Why do they think this? Because they see homeless people on their TV shows, and they're always dying on the TV shows, things like this. Occasionally, I talk to people in Canada. They think that people are dropping like flies dead in our streets here because they don't have access to health care. If it were the case, these people would be plastered all over the evening news, courtesy of those who are pushing for more government involvement in healthcare. 
hopefully some people will hear this and say, really, let me see the evidence. Most people are just going to say they're lying. Shifting gears for a moment, I want to talk about the finances of health insurance as opposed to the economics. I serve on the finance committee of a local organization, and we had occasion recently to review our employees' health insurance plans. This is the first time I ever sat down and went through line by line the details of what's involved, how much premium is charged to the employee, how much does the employer have to pay, what are the deductibles, and how does this compare across the various grades of plan from the bare bones plan up to the gold plated plan. And I came away with a fascinating conclusion. In fact, I looked at the numbers, the numbers are all correct as near as I can tell, and yet I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I went to someone I know who works in HR in a large corporation and showed this figures. I said, this can't be right. And the person said, oh, yes, it is. And here's what I found. If you look at the premium that you pay, the employee, and you look at what you get for that, so the higher the premium for the gold-plated plan, the less your deductible you're out of pocket, more things are covered, you have fewer co-payments, this kind of thing. But if you sit down and do the actual math, say, okay, suppose this year I had, pick a number, $10,000 worth of medical expenses. How much would it cost me at the end of the day in combination of the premiums I pay and the co-payments I have to pay and the deductibles and all of that? How much am I out of pocket at the end of the day with this great gold-plated plan? And then do the same thing. Suppose I've got the $10,000 in medical expenses for the year and I have the bare bones plan. My co-payments are higher. My deductible is higher. All of that. My premiums are less. At the end of the year, how much do I have to lay out? Would you believe the bare bones plan is a better deal? I would believe almost anything. I was astounded. I said, that can't be right. And not only is it a better deal, but it goes in sequence. The bare bones plan is a better deal than the bronze, which is a better deal than the silver, which is a better deal than the gold plated super plan. And so I asked my friend in the HR, how can this possibly be? And my friend says, yeah, this is kind of standard. We know this. It appears to be the case that the insurance companies understand that people aren't going to sit down and do the math I just did. They're going to see gold plated plan. That must be the best one. Give it to me. <laughs> And what happens? Well, they're doing the same thing a car dealer would do. You get the super car with all of the options and all of this stuff, and they charge a premium for it. I don't really need bells and whistles on my health care. Yeah. What I need is very simple. I need to be able to see a doctor from time to time. And in my 50s, I need to get a test done from time to time. And I need a bunch of refills on a bunch of medications. So I'm running these numbers and I'm considering somebody who has no use for a doctor. They're going to have little expenses. For someone with few expenses throughout the year, the bare bones plan is better. And then I consider somebody who has tremendous health care problems and requires lots of treatment and blah, blah, and all of this. Same deal. The bare bones plan is still better. Back when I had these difficult decisions to make regarding health care for a family of five, we didn't need the gold plan. It never occurred to me that that was what I wanted. I wanted legitimate insurance. We use that word in wrong ways when we talk about healthcare. What is insurance? It's protection against outlying events. Yes, it's not general maintenance. No, it's protection against things that you could never have predicted. Yeah. So I'm walking down the road holding the hand of my wife who is holding the hand of our daughter, and we all fall into a pit and we all break our legs. That's why I need health insurance. I don't need health insurance because I have diabetes. That's not unexpected. And honestly, with advances in the last bunch of decades with diabetes, I don't even need to talk about it with the doctor. I can probably get most of the way home on a Wikipedia page. I don't need specialists to charge me $100 to tell me what Wikipedia tells me for free. I'm not here making some kind of crazy argument that doctors don't know what they're doing. Of course they do. But I can figure it out pretty quickly in the few limited things I need to figure out. Why is that not good enough? Why do I not have insurance against catastrophes? Because that's what I'm looking for insurance for. Most people think it's to cover everything every day. That's not insurance. That's maintenance. And that's part of why health insurance has become more expensive. It's only a part. But people have come to want maintenance from their health insurance plans. You want the eyeglasses. You want the dental work or whatever it is. 
all right, fine, but that's going to increase the price of this thing. Every dime that your employer spends on your benefits package could have been a dime added to your salary. And therein lies another reason why health insurance has become more expensive, because the government doesn't tax the health insurance benefits. And so what's happened over time is that workers and employers have come to this agreement that the raises that the workers get will go predominantly to this tax-free thing, the health insurance, rather than to money in the pocket. And so what happens? You get greater demand for insurance, that's pushing insurance up, and you get the phenomenon we just talked about, which is I'm getting all this money thrown into my insurance plan. I now want my insurance to cover things that insurance really isn't meant to cover. And again, this increases the costs, which comes back in the form of higher premiums. Compensation has gone through the roof. And people say, no, it hasn't. This is what my paycheck has been every year for the last five years. They're blind to the benefits, which is part of compensation. You're looking at 30 40% of a total salary dedicated to a benefits package. It's a huge amount. And when people say things like the median workers' wages have stagnated, Bernie Sanders likes to say this, compensation, wages plus benefits, is up 50% since 1980. 50%. And that's adjusted for inflation. That's actual real purchasing power. Health insurance is one of these markets that people have an emotional attachment to. They have it to health insurance. They have it to labor markets. They have it to education. And somehow people think that when they attach an emotion to a market, that somehow the laws of economics shouldn't apply anymore. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if that's true of a reasonably large subset of the population, you've got a real problem when it comes to figuring out how to solve problems. Yeah, you've got a real problem because you aren't bringing to bear the tools you need to bring to bear, which are economic tools. Instead, you're bringing to bear the political tools. Because why? The politicians can get elected if you are emotionally involved. Just a little exercise for people who are listening. Go take a look at Bernie's Twitter feed and count the number of times he uses the word must. Mm. You rarely see a tweet come out that Bernie hasn't used the word must in. And when you can start paying attention to the use of certain words in a language, you start to get an insight into the soul. People who use the word must all the time, what they're saying is that we must use the power of government the way they want us to. That's coercive language. That's exactly correct. And if you're right from how we led into this issue, Ant, we're spending a lot of money on healthcare, and we're not really getting what was promised of course we're not getting what we were promised, because who promised it? A bunch of politicians. They don't have to pay the price if you don't get what they said you would get. Healthcare more expensive, maybe better, but more expensive. The big promise turned out to be a lie. And fewer people are uninsured, but it seems to be the case that that's only because they've shifted over to Medicare, or in your case, the government's fined them to the extent that they hold up their hands and say, fine, I'll buy the insurance, just stop fining me. And that last part that I wanted to get into the pile, I'm, it's a personal thing with me. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Mm. Oh, my God. I have been through so many doctors since this legislation took place. I don't think I've kept one even for a complete calendar year. And then when you try to get another one, because they all retire, they leave the practice, whatever. When you try to get an appointment with somebody new, they'll say things like, okay, we're booked out for eight months. Right. Right. What did I say earlier? I need my prescriptions refilled. Who will not refill my prescriptions? Somebody who is not my doctor. Can't say I blame them. I wouldn't either. But that leaves me in a bind and millions of other people in the exact same bind. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. You can join us next week when we will talk about something that's maybe even marginally uplifting because this wasn't. Until then, you can follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. You can join us at Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues. And, and what you really want to hear is that you can send us email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. And until we meet again, take care of yourself. And if you can, notice it's not a blanket thing. It doesn't cover every eventuality. But if you can, if it's possible, if you can do it without too much cost to yourself, why don't you try and be a little nicer to people? It doesn't even have to be that big a deal. Just a little bit. I'll catch you later. See you next week, James. 